Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome. Welcome and welcome from the bottom of our hearts and Eid Mubarak. Can't believe the day is finally here, Eid ul Adha. And we are absolutely delighted to be spending it with our loved ones, all in good health. And of course, the festivities have already begun. The men are gone to the mosque and inshallah thereafter, they will be going to the Kabristan to go and read a Fatiha for our dearly departed. And then uh, the Qurbani starts, which we all so look forward to. And after a long, arduous two or three hours of uh, Qurbani uh, preparations and slaughtering and sorting out the meat, sending it off to the cutters and the packers, etc., it will be time for the family to get together for our Eid lunch, which we all truly, truly look forward to. And as we speak about this Mubarak day of Eid ul Adha, um, I sat uh, transfixed uh, in front of my TV yesterday watching uh, the coverage by Hilal TV, obviously, of the day of Arafah and all of the amazing interviews that played out. And we just hope and pray, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, grants Hajj Mabrul, Hajj Mabru to all of the Hujaj. And I must say that it was so beautiful watching all of uh, the rituals that were being undertaken by the Hujaj. And uh, it was very, very uplifting. The coverage here was great. And it made me feel like if it was at all possible to wave a magic wand and be there, uh, you know, uh, in the Holy Lands, I would have done that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send our invitation again soon so that we can visit the Holy Lands for either Umrah or Hajj. To one and all, all our South African brothers and sisters, and to all of our friends and family all around the world, Eid Mubarak may be blessed with noor and khair in every possible way. Have a wonderful day with your loved ones, inshallah, and make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings us all together for another Eid ul Adha in a year's time. That is the greeting to our South African friends. Let's also greet our friends that are abroad. One such friend is going to join us in a minute or two. She's based in Doha. Her name is Nadia Matara. She is an educationist. She's been in education for the past 36 years, and she has been living in Qatar for six years. She is um, the principal of a very large girls' international school. She's going to be talking about Eid in Qatar. They celebrated yesterday, but we're going to uh, hear about just how exciting, how interesting, and how fun-filled the Eid was for the people in that part of the world. Nadia Matara, assalamu alaikum, welcome to the program. And Eid Mubarak for yesterday. <laughs> oh, alaikum salam, uh, Auntie Julie, and Eid Mubarak to all the viewers back home in South Africa. Alhamdulillah. Uh, it's really lovely just to connect with uh, somebody from back home. Absolutely. We're delighted that you're able to take the time out to talk to us. Um, let's talk about your time in Doha. In, um, you've been there for about six years. You are a principal of an international school. What is that experience like? And we are going to be talking Eid festivities as well. But I do also know that there are a lot of expats in Doha, all around the UAE for that matter. Uh, do you guys get together on these auspicious occasions like Eid, for example? Uh, yes, of course we do. Um, and usually, particularly the South African family, you know, wherever you go around the world, the South Africans will always tend to find each other. Um, just as a matter of interest, 75% of the population here are made up of expats. So whilst we are in Doha celebrating Eid with, with Qatari people, we also get the unique opportunity of celebrating Eid with people from around the world. So at my school, for example, I've got um, people from about 34 different countries. So we get to celebrate Eid and uh, other festivities and get to know cultures and traditions from people, not only the local people, but from people around the world as well. So Alhamdulillah, we are really fortunate to have uh, that opportunity. Subhanallah. Uh, so tell us, did you with your family and the other uh, South Africans have a typical South African Eid? 
or was it very different? And is it different because you are in Doha? Um, I think while we still try to hold on dearly to our South African traditions, uh, we do embrace what goes on here, especially if you've been here for, for a long time. Uh, it almost becomes a home away from home. Um, so uh, Eid morning would traditionally start like back home with uh, the Eid Salah, which is um, an outside congregational gathering. Um, the country is really small, so it's an opportunity just for everybody to get to know each other and to meet each other. So really wonderful. Uh, after that, families generally go back home. They have a light breakfast. Uh, and then they offer kurbani. The breakfast would mainly be uh, of an Arabic food nature, your hummus and your pitas and your pickles. Um, and of course, well, for us South Africans, the table is not complete without your traditional pies and samosas and homemade <laughs> cool. biscuits. And um, people then do their kurbani. It's normally done, um, lots of local people would do the kurbani still very traditionally at their homes. Others would do it at abattoirs. And um, the festivities really begin after Maghrib in the evening. Uh, it's wonderful. It's a beautiful, festive atmosphere all over. Festival of lights. Uh, the malls are decorated. Um, the streets are decorated. Children and families are out and about. Um, the entire country is on holidays. So during Eid, for both the Eids, uh, the country gets at least, uh, it, I think it's five days off, so the banks are closed, um, restaurants operate on, um, on skeleton staff, and everybody just has the opportunity to be out and about and to celebrate. You're talking about your traditional lunch. We would um, love our biryani and our sujis and that kind of thing, but here uh, the traditional food would be something called majboos, which is a savory rice and a a very uh, slow cooked lamb on the top with lots of vegetables. And then the traditional sweets, of course, your kunafas, um, your lokemat, which is a little dough ball dunked in, uh, dunked in syrup, um, uh, saffron cake, um, baklava, all the lovely sweet uh, delights that you would find in the Middle East. So yes, while we do enjoy our traditional South African uh, treats, uh, we also have the opportunity to to get to enjoy the Middle Eastern treats as well. And then, of course, treats from around the world, really, because I, at the moment I've got a Singaporean couple that are living with me just for a few days. So yesterday we got the chance to try some traditional Singaporean food for breakfast and then again some sweet treats for lunch. So absolutely lovely, really, really lovely. So Nadia, tell me, um, you guys are on a five-day Eid al-Adha break. You, you indicated that both Eids, alhamdulillah, the government, uh, you know, declares a five-day holiday for the Eid. Um, what do you do in the schoolroom to prepare the kids and to build them up for this amazing, spiritual, but at the same time, very festive time of the year? And very especially, well, in fact, with both Eids, it's steeped in history, in spirituality and history. What does that type of um, uh, your uh, lesson plans look like? And how do the children buy into it? Because obviously they've also got their home traditions, which uh, is passed down from, you know, from, uh, uh, from generation to generation. And how would you work around all of that? So um, the, both the Eids, both the Ramadan Eid and um, uh, the Eid of Sacrifice are built into our curriculum. So leading up to the celebration, there's a lot that goes on at school, lots of competitions, art competitions, role plays, assemblies. Um, there are bulletin boards, um, you know, talking about Ibrahim alayhi salam and talking about the whole uh, concept of sacrifice um, and then on a more spiritual level, the children, we use this time at school to get the students to reflect uh, on values, on virtues, on vices, and what is it that they need to sacrifice in the year, come in the year ahead. Um, you know, what negativity would they like to let go of uh, in order to become better people? 
um, the, this program is not only done uh, at our school, it's a national program. Uh, this year, the government had a beautiful values program and they, um, it was themed around my values shape my identity. So getting students really just to look deep within and what role am I playing in helping to shape a future world? So getting them to appreciate who they are, being patriotic, so I'm locally rooted, but I'm globally competent. I'm still a global citizen, part of this huge world. So um, a beautiful atmosphere at school as well. There are lots of Eid decorations, but um, excuse me, within that, um, there's a lot of zikr playing all the time. The children get uh, the opportunity in the Islamic lessons to learn about the story of Ibrahim al Islam, uh, reenacted in, in assemblies, um, write stories about it, um, posts on social media about it. So really just um, getting them to realize that this is not just a celebration, but it's a very, very deep spiritual experience for each and every one of them. And Alhamdulillah, it's beautiful okay. to, to watch these little girls sitting deep in reflection and actually taking the time to write about. Um, uh, I'm, I don't share a lot in next year. I want, uh, in the year ahead, I want to make an effort to share with my friends. I'm letting go of that um, vice that I have of not being a good sharer. So it's just uh, yeah, okay. really amazing. Nadia, can we go for our first ad break? When we get back, we want to talk more about children, the school system, and just how the kids are all um, hyped up for this Mubarak day of Eid al -Adha. And also the same rules apply to um, Ramadan Eid. So please do stay with us. Welcome back to our Eid al Adha program. We do hope that you are enjoying it, but also I'm sure you're very, very busy trying to get the Eid breakfast done. And um, I know you're preparing to go off and uh, start uh, the issue around the Qurbani, as all families do. And lots of excitement with our kids here. So I have no doubt in my mind that. Um, this is playing out all around the world. Uh, we are talking with Nadia Mutara. She is a principal of an international school based in Doha, and she's taken some time out from a very busy and a very auspicious day, which is Eid al Adha, and she's talking to us. But of course, they celebrated Eid yesterday, but their festivities, as does ours here in South Africa, go on for a few days. So welcome back, Nadia, and I want to focus on the children. I know that you're very interested in the role of sport and culture, and you believe that brings people together very, very closely. It kind of uh, breaks down all barriers, alhamdulillah. We have about 10 minutes more uh, talk time with you before we wrap up. So how do you inculcate sport and culture with all of your Eid festivities at school and also in your home and amongst your friends? So yes, quite a few tournaments. Um competitions for students to participate in. The country is huge on arts and culture. For those who have been to Qatar, um, you'll know that there are lots of museums, lots of ex art exhibitions, um, all the, running all the time throughout the year. And the students actually get involved in, if there's an Now for Eat, for example, there was a poster competition, a story writing competition, uh, where children write their reflections on Eid, uh, their hopes, their dreams for a better world, etc. So um, we look forward to these national competitions twice a year, both for both the Eids. And Alhamdulillah, our girls actually do exceptionally well with them. Um, the girls in particular are becoming a lot more interested in sport. You know, the World Cup came and it brought a whole new vibe into the country, brought this energy of sport. The girls became more interested. And uh, at the moment, there's just so much for them to participate in. They have a very good system here where school children participate in the Qatar School Olympic program. Um, and they've got every Olympic sport that the girls can participate in. And generally close to Eid, 
they have uh, quite a few more competitions. And um, in recent years, I think in the last two years, parents have gotten involved as well. So, you know, if you go to the shopping malls or you go to the museums, you'll see children's art from schools around the country displayed. And uh, the Amir himself and the Amir's sister, Sheikha Amayasa, is very, very involved in arts and culture as well. So this is something that they promote. Um, we find that girls finish school, quite a few more of them are going into the arts. And then obviously, once they graduate, making a contribution to the country again. So um, it's really just that whole focus of you don't have to be uh, academically strong or intellectually uh, intelligent to to um, to be a success to be successful. You can do anything you want to be to be successful. So uh -huh. we've got um, quite a few Olymp I think two Olympians, Qatari Olympians. We've got our high jumper who's won gold, and uh, we've got a long distance runner who's also won gold. And uh, recently we've had. Um, a lady by the name of Asma Althani, who's conquered the four highest peaks in the world. So the girls have these inspirations that they um, want to, to imitate. And uh, really, alhamdulillah, it's wonderful to see that arts and culture and sport have really um, succeeded in uniting um, not only the country, uh, the people in the country, but uh, people in the region and around the world as well. Okay, so Nadia, you're, you're at an international school. Uh, do you have more expat children at the school or do you have a nice mix of uh, expat children and you have the locals as well? Because that's important because when you're living um, as an expat, you need to interact with the locals to get a sense of who they are and also get a sense of acceptance and enjoy the culture. And how different is the culture from the South African culture, the South African Muslim culture, obviously? Um, how does that play out? All right, so at the school that I'm at, we've got about 70% local girls oh. and then the 30% uh, of expat. And the expat population um, is made up of uh, girls from the UK, from Syria, from Palestine, from Jordan, Turkey, uh, Egypt, Lebanon, so um, Australia, New Zealand, so Ghana, um, so basically people from around the world. But um, I'd say at least 70% of them are local Qataris. Um, girls who, our school is a private school. So it's girls who mainly want to finish school and go ahead and study after they graduate. So we do get the opportunity to interact a lot, particularly with the mums and with the girls. And uh, that provides us with the experience of just learning more about the culture, the traditions, uh, learning about cultural sensitivity and, um, you know, embracing that because if I, at the school that I'm at, I've got uh, teachers from about 30 or 40 different countries as well. Whilst most of the teachers at my school are from the UK, because we follow the British national curriculum, uh, we do have teachers from around the world as well. Uh, I do have quite a few South African teachers. I think at the moment we are about um, almost 14, growing each year, alhamdulillah. But uh, teachers, like I said, mainly from the UK. The Turkish, Jordanian, Palestinian teachers, they would be the teachers who, who run the Islamic studies and the Arabic curriculum. So similar to South African Islamic schools, the curriculum runs parallel with the English curriculum. Is it an, is, is, are all your students at the school Muslim or do you have a bit of a mix of non-Muslims as well? Uh, we've got very few non-Muslims at my, at my particular school. And uh, there are very few all-girls schools, for private all-girls schools for Qatari girls. Uh, there are many local schools for all girls, but for, uh, in terms of private education, I think there are just two uh, or three all-girls schools. Uh, so a lot of the local parents choose to send their kids to our school. So um, they, get a very, they get the good British national curriculum uh, education, but at the same time, 
they maintain their strong Islamic identity. All right, we're going to be wrapping up in a minute or two. Let's talk, let's bring the focus back to this Mubarak day of Eid al-Adha. And let's talk about, um, do you kind of get invited out to the local girls' homes to celebrate? Is the exchanging of gifts this time around, um, how does that all play out? Or is it just really, um, you know, the expats doing their own thing? The locals do tend to be very private. Um, if we do get invited out, it, it, well, very rarely, to be honest. Um, the, the parents tend to come to us rather than us go to them. So we would have a celebration at school and they will bring their food and there would be an exchange of gifts. Um, but on a national level, there's an exchange of gifts for the public as well. So on the night of Eid, uh, so last night, the first night of Eid, you would go to um, shopping malls or cultural villages and there would be gifts that are just given out to the general public and that's from the government. So I haven't really had the chance to get one of those or stand in a queue to get one of those to see what it is, but it is a gift. So um, the, the Qataris by nature are very warm, uh, very generous, very respectful, but at the same time, very private. So if you do visit them, you would really go into their actual homes. They each have a majlis that's attached to their homes, which is a little um, welcome lounge, if you like, at the front of their home. So if you visit them, you would be escorted into the majlis and that's where you would be served uh, and they would welcome you. So we very rarely get the opportunity to go into their homes uh, and sit at the same table as they do. But like I said, there is that opportunity for them uh, to come to school and engage with us on that level. Absolutely fascinating. Wish I had more time to talk with you, Nadia. But undoubtedly, you are, um, you know, you started your day uh, brilliantly yesterday, from what I'm hearing, with your family and all the other expat South Africans. And there are still a few more days of festivities ahead of you. Uh, so enjoy, <laughs> yeah. keep us in your duas. And till the wow. next time, uh, inshallah, when we do hook up again, have a wonderful day. Keep us in your duas. And salamu alaikum to you. I mean, thanks so much, Auntie Julie. Wa alaikum salam. Well, there you have it, Eid in Qatar. It sounds fascinating. It sounds interesting. And I can't wait to uh, visit Nadia in Qatar and uh, just, uh, you know, get the experience of the Qatari hospitality. In a minute or two, we'll be going down under, and that, of course, is to Australia. We're going to be talking with Harun Kaji, and he's going to be talking about Eid in Australia. So I do look forward to that as well. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. Uh, we've just done talking with an amazing person. And that, of course, was Nadia Mutara in Qatar. She is a um, principal at a private school there, talking to us about the experience of a Qatari Eid ul-Adha. She's been there for six years and absolutely loves it there. Uh, but it was so lovely hearing about how the Qataris celebrate Eid. We're now going down under. We're going to Australia and we're going to hear from another expat what Eid is like in Australia. But he has also lived in Malaysia uh, for quite some time. And we're going to ask him about Eid in Malaysia as well. Undoubtedly, he still has some very strong connections, uh, friends in uh, Malaysia. Uh, my guest, of course, is Harun Kaji. He is an expat, as I have indicated. He is a commercial manager for a company listed on the New York Stock Exchange based in Perth, Australia. And of course, that is where he resides. He's formerly from Standerton and he's worked in the oil and gas industry in the UK, South Africa, Malaysia and Indonesia for over 40 years. And he's going to talk about his experiences all around the world. He's most proud about his two lovely children, uh, not forgetting that his two grandchildren have stolen a piece of his heart. Harun Kaji, Salaamu Alaikum, welcome to the program. Wa Alaikum Salaam, Julia, how are you? Eid Mubarak. And to you as well, thank you indeed. And yes, grandchildren do steal our hearts, don't they? 
Oh, absolutely. I, 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 have, I play all kinds of games with, I, I do makeup, doctor, doctor, hide and seek, and all kinds of monster, monster games. There's a standard half an hour before her bedtime that we get to play, so. Oh, wonderful. And this is about our children and our grandchildren, mainly about our grandchildren, isn't it? When the Eids come around, all our focus is obviously on the Eid festivities and the rituals and explaining to them how important it is. But that um, quality time with them. Uh, absolutely. And, and, and more so in migrant communities, because you tend to, to kind of gravitate away from your traditions and, and your normal family units and stuff. So it's really, really important for migrant communities to maintain those traditions, to create those memories that we had as children for our grandchildren, so that they grow up with the similar kind of memories that we had. So, you know, particularly as a migrant, I think it's absolutely important. I, I'm, I'm a big believer. We have a big event today. We're expecting 30, 40 people to come for supper shortly. Uh, on Saturday, we've organized a, a kurbani. We're lucky to manage to get a farmer who's willing to do that for us because it's very difficult here. And, 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 and it's simply so that the children have the same experiences growing up. We maintain those strong traditions that we grew up with. And, and, and that, I believe, is absolutely critical. Harun, I read one of your messages suggesting that uh, the Qurbani or finding a farmer was a bit of a challenge. Is this because of, uh, you know, council or health regulation rules that... Yeah, absolutely. This... It's, it's got to do with health. Yeah, it's got to do with health regulations. You can only slaughter in a, in, in a, in a certified abattoir. And, but the only exception are certain farmers. A farmer can slaughter on his, on his uh, small holding or the, or the farm, but generally not for commercial purposes. So, you know, you're lucky when you find somebody who's willing to assist us. We've managed to find somebody and there's about 10 of us getting together, but we're going to do that on, in two days time on Saturday. And we want to take the kids there. We're going to take some breakfast there and we're going to make a nice morning of it. And, 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 and we've got a butcher who's willing to help us then you know, slice up the meat, package it and, and ship it. Now, before this, a lot of people would traditionally send their money abroad to India, to Africa, to South Africa, because it was difficult to try and get anybody here uh, or, or, or do any kind of slaughtering here on a personal basis. So... So this, this we, we're really excited about this. Uh, you know, over the years, some have managed. Fortunately, we've managed this time and we're really looking forward to it. Um, it has been a challenge from what I hear over the years. Uh, do you find that the Australians are beginning to relax more and understand um, our culture and are more willing to assist Is you know, as the years I, go I, by? I think, I, I think in Australia particularly, there's a wider acceptance of Islam and, and Muslims and an understanding of... The, the, our celebrations and our holidays, for example, in my workspace with Juma, et cetera, right? So that, that's, that's, you know, as time goes, they become more educated. We have a responsibility to, to, to kind of inform people as well of what our expectations are and what our beliefs and values and traditions are. But, you know, the, 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 the slaughtering, the matter of slaughter, there will be no relaxation in the rules. You know, they're not going to anytime soon. In fact, recently, the Australian government is looking at banning the export of live sheep to the Middle East for Qurbani because, you know, a lot of the sheep uh, that are slaughtered in the Middle East come from Australia and, and they, they're concerned about the, the heat and, 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 and the method of transport for, for these animals. So from a, from a health perspective, I don't think it's going to get relaxed anytime soon, but certainly they understand our traditions and you, you'll find a, a sympathetic farmer here and there who's willing to assist. Talk to us about the mix of the different Muslims from different countries. Um, do you kind of just stick with uh, expat South African Muslims or do you find that you do try and integrate with other Muslims as well? I know there's Turkish Muslims, I know there's Lebanese Muslims, etc. And, you know, do you interact a lot with them? I, I, I think, look, let, let's be frank, right? We want cultural affinity. We have some things in common. So we look for people that are common to us, our language, our culture, our sense of humor, our traditions, you know, everything's very similar, but there's a lot of little nuances and differences in different cultures. So generally, generally in the masjids, you, you tend to get, you know, there's, there's a, a masjid that's predominantly Malay, there's a Turkish masjid, there's a Bosnian masjid, uh, you know, the Arabs go to a certain masjid. There, there's a lot of blending as well, but the celebrations generally is South Africans will kind of associate with other South Africans, right? And the Lebanese will go to their groups and, and, and the Turks will stay within their groups because everyone has slightly different nuances in the way they celebrate things. And, and, and generally, the, the men folk maybe 
mix a lot more because they're working. Uh, but the women folk maybe are more traditional and stay at home in some of these communities. So it's harder for them to kind of just network. So as far as uh, Eid and the children are concerned, because the focus is really, of course, it's steeped in uh, spirituality, rituals, uh, which, you know, is um, our responsibility to make sure that our children and grandchildren uh, follow through, understand what it's all about. But we do try and make it as festive as possible for the children. What is it that uh, you guys do in Australia to make the children realize that this is a very, very special time in the life of a Muslim? So what we do is, uh, me particularly, right, uh, during Ramadan as well, we start sensitizing the children, making them excited, getting them new clothes, going out shopping. Uh, and then we, you know, they get excited because their friends are coming around for dinner and, and it's a weekday and I don't go to school, right? So any, my six-year-old uh, granddaughter is really excited because she doesn't get to go to school one day in the week. And her friends, Aisha and, 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 and the other kids are coming around. So she's all excited. So we, you know, we make particularly sure, and I'm very, very strong on this, is, is, is ensuring that they are sensitized to the coming of, of the day uh, during Ramadan as well and, and, and during Eid al-Adha as well. It's starting to become a little, it's starting to get diluted here. People sort of tend to think this is not, uh, you know, an important holiday, especially in, 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 in Australia. I noticed even some of our South Africans are starting to say, well, I, I need to go to work. Maybe I'll come for supper in the evening, right? So they're not making as much as effort for with Eid al-Adha as they do with Eid al-Fitra. So I, I, I think that's, that's why I think it's really, really important. So of course it's clothes, it's time off from school, your friends are gonna come around and they're always having a bit of fun, right? In these migrant communities in modern times, it's not like we went out in the street and played with kids all the time. So having kids around is an exciting time for children. What sort of challenges uh, do you face in Australia, particularly as Muslims and particularly during these very uh, special days in our lives as Muslims, the two Eids, Ramadan and, of course, Eid e uh, and Eid al-Adha? I, I think, you know, as migrants, one of the things that, that affects you the most, and certainly in the early years, it's a little harder, uh, the social dislocation from your family unit, right? A lot of South Africans will phone me and they'll say, Harun, you know, I'm interested in migrating, you know, do you, you know, I want to talk to them. And the first question I'll say is, you know, ask your wife, you, you've migrated, it's your first eat, and you don't know anyone. You can't run to your mom, your sisters, your family, your cousins, eat days, funerals. What would you like? Would she accept it? And a lot of people say, well, my wife said she can't live with that, right? So the social dislocation is the, is, is, is the first thing. Naturally, when you're in a migrant community and, and your, 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 your traditional behaviors, your norms, you, people want to assimilate a little bit. You know, we, we're not in cocoons anymore. We, we, we're living in a, in a completely sort of westernized environment. So there's a gravitation away from, from, from our traditions, right? And, 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 and a lot of people are kind of sort of slowly like kind of blending out. They, they, they're diluting their traditions and their values and the, and the religion is being blended out. You know, there is a risk. The first Muslims came here over 150 years ago. There were Afghan cameliers and some Muslim Indians. And most of those people, because they weren't strong communities, large communities, institutions, a lot of them blended out of Islam. Okay, so Harun, that risk. may I interrupt you here? We need to go for an ad break. When we come back, you can continue that train of thought. And then I also want to talk about Eid in Malaysia because you spent some time there as well. So please stay with us. Sure. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Welcome back. We're talking about Eid al-Adha. Alhamdulillah, it is Eid here in South Africa. We're celebrating it as we always do with family, friends, lots of good food. And of course, the focus being on Qurbani. Earlier on, we spoke with Nadia Mutara in Doha. We're now talking with Harun Kaji in Australia. Um, and the importance of Eid, the importance of being with family, the importance of passing down these very important and beautiful messages of our traditions, our culture, and of course, woven through all of that is the spiritual aspect as well. Harun, welcome back. Thank you. Sorry for the interruption. You were talking about challenges. Yeah, so those are the challenges, you know, it, it, the, the, the dilution of our traditions and values, people blending out of Islam, and there's a great risk of that, especially our children and their children. 
And, you know, I, I don't just think about today. I think about my granddaughter and her children and their children until the end of time. So, you know, we, 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 there's a big focus on, on, on maktabs, madrasas, mosques, institutions, values, traditions. As I always say to, to my daughters and to everybody who would listen to me, if you don't respect your values and traditions, no one else is going to. So you need to project. You, we are Muslims, you know, we, we, we don't have to assimilate. We, we have to work alongside other cultures and other value systems, but we don't have to assimilate to the point where we have to give up our values and our traditions. So I think that's very important. And, and these days like Eid and Qurbani and these traditions are equally important in that whole process of sensitizing our children and their children so that they grow up with the similar kind of values and traditions we grew up with ingrained and imbued in them so that they can carry it forth to, 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 you know, to their children and their children after, long after we've gone. So I know you spent uh, quite some time in Malaysia as well. How different was Eid in Malaysia and the whole issue around our value systems and our beautiful Dean of Islam and just, uh, you know, interacting with Malaysians uh, across the board. Was that a very different experience? And did you find that they were more welcoming and more supportive, uh, of, of, you know, uh, being Muslim, majority of them being Muslims themselves? As I always said, in Malaysia, it's a wonderful country and we spent 10 years there. And, 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 and I always have plans to, when I get old and cold and retire, I want to go back there. <laughs> Malaysia is our world. It's our world. It's, it's English speaking. It's very user friendly. It's, it's a world designed for Muslims, but with an element of modernity. So it has the East and the West and modernity. So it is, if you ask me, the most optimal place I would like to live in for the kind of values, traditions, the place, the people, the weather, all things. Everything is very similar. So the few things are common, right? So it's festive and joyous occasions. It's about food. It's about gathering of family. It's friends. Everyone dresses up. And then, of course, the religious traditions and rituals are very similar. So that's the common things across all the countries I've lived in. What is distinct in Malaysia, there's a few exciting things. Firstly, the, the, the Eid holiday, particularly Eid, uh, Eid al-Fitra, was very, very similar to between Christmas and New Year in South Africa. Everybody was off. The whole place had shut down. So, you know, the, the whole place is optimized and designed for, for the Eid holidays, right? So the, it's a festive time, everybody's into it. But there's uh, something's really unique about it. One, it was highly commercialized. So you've got, you got Eid jingles and stuff in the sh shops and, sh and the shopping malls and there's lights everywhere. And, 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 and when I first got there, I, I used to see a lot of lights. I got there in the middle of Ramadan in 94 and I saw a lot of lights and I thought it was maybe Diwali, you know, mm -hmm. because it, was, it looked like the festival of lights. And, and, and they say, Hari Raya. Hari Raya is, Hari is day, Raya is the joyous day. So they'll say, Slamat Hari Raya. Well wishes for the joyous day, Eid al-Fitra. But they don't always say Eid al-Fitra. So I used to see Slamat Hari Raya. So all these lights, I thought Hari Raya, Hari Rama, Hari Krishna. I, 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 for once, for a second, I thought it was some kind of Hindu holiday. And then I realized it wasn't. So, th so the first thing is highly commercialized. So, so there's, a, there's a huge, uh, you know, everything's shopping malls, everybody's excited. The second different thing is, it, they go, it's called Bali Kampung. They go back to the villages. The Malay Malaysians had, you know, especially the Malay uh, cohort, had, 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 had only recently urbanized in the last 30 years. So during, during Eid, particularly Eid al-Fitra, there's a mass migration of people going back to their ancestral home, to the villages. So the roads are like, like the road from Durban to Johannesburg to Durban at Easter, right? Everybody's on the road. The city empties out. And people go what they call Bali Kampung. It's very common in Indonesia as well. Millions of people in Indonesia go on the move and they go back to their villages, to their ancestral homes, to where their parents and grandparents are, and they spend Eid there. So that, that's the one feature that was different. Then they have another thing called open house concept. So your prime minister will have an open house or the sultan or the king. I've attended a few in the early years when we didn't know many people. So you, you go to the prime minister's house with thousands of people, you queue up, you greet him, and, and then you have a bit of food and you disappear, right? And then it could be corporate events up to three weeks after a company will have an open house for Eid and invite all their you know, important clients and guests and, and, and things at a restaurant, for example. Or people will have open house at their home. So they might say, come between 12 and 8 o'clock and three, 400 people would come. You'd come in, you'd pay your respects, uh, you'd have a little bit and, 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 and you'd disappear. 
towards our end of our time in, in Malaysia in 2004, we had about nine invites. So we used to start early in the morning after Salah and then to just go from house to house and house and visit everybody and, and in the evening spend some time with our friends. So you, you, you had this Bali Kampung, going back to the village, you had this open house concept where people gathered in large groups and, but, and there was a lot of food bazaars and there was very traditional dress. You know, we don't have that anymore. Uh, you know, we have very westernized dress, so we got Arabic dress, right? So we don't really go back to our traditions. They have very colorful traditional dress, Baju Malayu it's called, Malay, Mal Malay dress in a literal translation. So, but it's very exciting, a lot of fun. But again, you know, in the early years, we didn't have a lot of friends. And as we were finding our feet, eventually when we had friends, it was, it was a lot of fun. And, and, and uh, we, we had some really great memories of Eid with friends and, and you know, inevitably as migrants, family, become your surrogate family. Uh, friends become your surrogate family. So, so for Eid, for, for today particularly, we're gonna have about 35, 40 people. We have a couple from Gambia, we have people from uh, Malaysia, we have people from the UK, we have people, but you know, a lot of them are Pakistani, English origin. We have some South African people. We have all kinds of people coming around and they become your surrogate family because I insist, we're gonna have big pots of biryani, lots of legs of lamb, and we're going to have a lot of traditional food. And I take a day off. Uh, yesterday I was off so that we could, I could help my wife. We don't have any domestic helpers here. So, you know, I, I, I make a particularly big effort to, uh, related to, to, to the day. Okay, so just going back to Malaysia, uh, what happens there with Idul Adha and Kurbani? Because that, this is what it's about. Idul Adha is about sacrifice. It's very similar to South Africa. The, the, the people do it in their backyards, in their homes. In fact, we used to go to a place, not even five minutes from the Twin Towers, there's a Malay reserve land. So it's a very traditional area. It's about five minutes from the KL Twin Towers that you might have seen if you've been to Malaysia. And it's called Malay reserve land. So there's only Malays live there. There's a couple of mosques. It's very traditional. And it was, it was promulgated as reserve land and it can't be developed, it can't be, you know, it would be probably worth billions today. So we would normally go to a place called Kampong Melayu, which is Malay village. And they'd be, you know, all over the place, they'd be slaughtering in somebody's backyard, in the mosques. And we would just go there just to kind of soak up that atmosphere whilst we were there. When we lived in Johor Bahru, uh, you know, we used to drive out. You could drive anywhere and you'd find people all over the place slaughtering, especially in the rural areas. There'd be a lot of that happening. Normally in, in the mosques, at every mosque, there'd be a slaughter place. Some people, you know, if they had a big enough house, uh, they'd do it at, uh, in, in their backyard. So it's very similar to the old South Africa that I knew where everybody did it at home. Okay, we've got two minutes to wrap up. I'm going to ask you to share something amazing uh, from your travels all around the world, and then we'll wrap up. And I do wish you, your loved ones, and all of your guests, and um, all the other expats, South Africans in Australia, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful day of uh, Eid celebration. So over to you in a minute to wrap up. Travel, see the world and, 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 and embrace the diversity. We lived in cocoons in South Africa for many, many years. We, we, we were very kind of focused on, on, on who we were and our own culture and our own values. There's a beautiful, wonderful world out there. And in Islam and Muslims are very, very diverse. Embrace that diversity and bring this ummah together. You know, the, I'm not saying give up our traditions and values, but we must be Muslim first. The notion of one ummah first. I'm sorry, I get, I get quite emotional about the subject, but we must also maintain our values. The ummah, is very divided. And the only way we can come together is if we embrace this diversity, we understand who we are, learn to respect other cultures, learn to respect the slight differences in the way people do things, in the way they believe things, and, and you'll find that the world will be a much better place for it. Alhamdulillah, isn't that what Hajj is all about? The coming together Absolutely. of different Muslims. Isn't that what there it's all go. about? Harun Kaji, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. I thoroughly enjoyed it. 
wish I had more time. But who knows, we can talk again sometime in the future. Love, salams and duas to everyone down in Australia, your loved ones as well. And it is assalamu alaikum and khuda hafiz from us. Wa alaikum salam and Eid Mubarak and khuda hafiz. And there you have it, the end of our special show here on Eid's Day, Eid Ul Adha Perspective, bringing you two guests from opposite sides of the world. The one was in Doha and the one in Australia. I do hope that it's given you a bit of perspective on how people celebrate Eid differently in different parts of the world. But at the end of the day, we are all one. We are all one Ummah. We are all Muslim. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us grounded, keep us together and keep us united. Till the next time, as always, Assalamu Alaikum and Khuda Fez from me, Julie Ali. Wow.